Um, welcome to this panel. It was originally titled, when I first got the um, email about it a couple of months ago, Are American Men in Crisis? And then it was updated to American Men in Crisis. So I think it's, it's been decided by Aspen that American men are in crisis. And um, we have four superb panelists to discuss this. And I thought to begin, I would have them introduce themselves briefly so you get a little bit of a sense of who they are and what their perspective on this is. Or rather, what their background is, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> you want to start here? Mm -hmm. um, my name's Thomas uh, Page McBee. I go by my full name. Uh, I'm a writer and journalist. Uh, I was an editor at Quartz for many years, and uh, I'm the author of the forthcoming book, Amateur, uh, which is a book about chronicling uh, my journey as a trans man, training to be the first trans guy to fight in Madison Square Garden, and what I learned about masculinity in the process. I'm Tristan Bridges. I'm an assistant professor of sociology at the University of California, um, Santa Barbara. And um, I study the different ways that different groups of men engage with gender politics and how they um, come to think of themselves as having or not having gender political identities. My name is Michael Kimmel. Uh, I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Men and Masculinities at Stony Brook University, where I'm a professor. Um, I've written a bunch of books, um, one of the, uh, which I'll be signing later, uh, Angry White Men um, which, uh, and Healing from Hate, which is about how young uh, neo-Nazi skinhead white supremacists get out of the movement. Um, and I've been working a, a, as an activist. I've been working for about 40 years on trying to find ways to engage men to support gender equality. Good morning, my name is Joseph Nelson. I'm a visiting assistant professor of education at Teachers College, Columbia University. I'm on sabbatical from Swarthmore College where I'm a faculty in their Department of Educational Studies. I'm a senior research fellow with the Center for the Study of Boys and Girls' Lives, which is housed within the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. I began my career in education as a first grade teacher in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I grew up. And it was in a single sex intervention for a group of six year old black boys that were labeled at the age of six at risk. And so my interest has been around how we can better support black boys learning and development during childhood. So as I said, an excellent panel. And I, I wanted to just say, well, the, my sort of first take on this topic is we hear so much about women feeling very much under attack in America now, the women's marches, the response to um, the President Trump's, um, the things that he said about women, the things that he's done to women, and a sense that it's women who are, are really roiling with feelings of, of shock at, at, at being sort of stepping backwards when there seemed to have been a great step forward. So we look at this other side of the equation, men in crisis, and probably the two are connected. So I hope that each of you could speak a little bit from your, your field or your personal experience. How do you answer this question, are American men in crisis? And we'll start at the year end, Tom, and, and go down. Um, so I've been reporting on the masculinity crisis since, since 2011, um, which is also when I began my transition, and I was 30 years old at the time. So uh, I've had a personal as well as sort of socio-political interest in this question for a really long time. I know that it's actually been um, the masculinity crisis as a term has been used. I'm sure these guys can answer this better than me, but I think it's been since the 90s in academia. So it's not new, even though it might feel new. And um, I also think maybe they can speak better to the sort of economic and sociological underpinnings of it. But um, the fact is, obviously, some men are in crisis in the sense that men have lost jobs, men are committing suicide at higher rates, men are more likely to be mass shooters. Um, there's, there's clearly something wrong. Uh, but I also experienced myself socialization at a much later age than a lot of people do in terms of masculinity. And as I was reporting on this crisis that felt like, a, you know, sort of like this fixed thing about men, um, I was also experiencing what it was to become a man. And to me, these things seemed linked to each other. And I eventually concluded, you know, that masculinity, the way we socialize it, is the crisis. Um, I think that the way that we socialize men and boys to be in the world, and I can speak more to this later, um, is creating conditions for exactly the kind of thing that's happening right now. And I actually think that this crisis, uh, though painful, is also an opportunity to rethink the way that gender works. Um, and so I have a lot more thoughts on that, but I'll let other people speak to this question too. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree with Thomas that I think masculinity sort of partially ha has always been kind of constituted as crisis. Um, in masculinity studies, this conversation kind of emerged in the 80s and 90s, mm -hmm. like you're suggesting. And 
we've always said for something to be in crisis, it had to have been in some stable state mm -hmm. initially. Mm -hmm. And we sort of lack that when it comes to masculinity. Masculinity has always been in a little bit of flux. Um, usually when we start to label it as in crisis, it's when a very particular group of men starts to feel some kind of gendered anxiety. And it's usually like white, middle and upper class, heterosexual men that start to feel a little bit of uncertainty and unease about what it means to be a man or their position in the world becomes a little less secure than it used to be. And sometimes when that happens, we decide, we label for everyone that masculinity must be in crisis for all of us. Um, and so I think an important question when it comes to the crisis of masculinity is, is asking who's it a crisis right. for? Yeah, right. um, I completely agree. Thomas, you said that you know, many, we've been talking about this masculinity crisis since the 90s, um, actually since the 1890s. <laughs> um, at the turn of the last century, there were tons of, of uh, uh, articles and newspapers and books about masculinity in crisis at the turn of the, tw at, at the, the, turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Um, and at the time, the reasons given were mass industrialization had reduced the, the autonomy of the individual worker with his work, um, the big factory, northern migration of, of blacks into, into cities, the, the rise of a visible gay subculture, and most importantly, um, the feminization of boys boys, because boys were now surrounded, because men were now leaving home to go to work, um, they were surrounded by women. Women were teaching boys how to become men. Sunday school teachers, elementary school teachers, mothers. And so there were, at the turn of the 20th century, boys' liberation movements. There was a Christina Hoff Summers in, in, in 1890 um, who, was, who were talking about boys need to be liberated from the feminizing clutches of women. Um, and, um, and so uh, it, the Boy Scouts of America was founded in 1910 for that very reason. Get boys away, give them a you know, the, 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 the the freshness of, the, of nature, let them troop off to, into the woods with other boys and male leaders, which we, we now would say, uh-oh. Um, <laughs> but, but then it was you know, seen as a bromide. So, so all I'm saying is, is I'm agreeing with Tristan, there's, always been a, there's often been a sense that there is a crisis of masculinity, and the crisis of masculinity today, in part, I think is exactly that one group of men feels as though their, their, their power is slipping. So if there's a crisis, I would say, um, I, I subtitled Angry White Men, uh, American Masculinity at the End of an Era. And the era that I was trying to describe is an era of unquestioned male entitlement. Mm -hmm. That all of those positions were supposed to be ours. That when I was, you know, that when you hear men speak about, you know, as I, my first in, in encounter with, with this was, on a TV talk show when a man said, you know, a black woman stole my job. And I said, tell me about the word my. Where did you get the idea it was your job? When you hear people in the Tea Party say, make, uh, t t t say we have to take our country back, who's the we in the sentence, right? The only people who could say that legitimately in the United States are Native Americans, right? So, so what does that, so it's that entitlement, that's what's slipping, you know, and you hear a crisis when, you know, in my grandfather's era, we had 98% of all the positions of power. Now we have 88%. Oh my God, the tide has completely turned. Mm. <laughs> yeah. We're in crisis. <laughs> so I think about this question in relation to black boys and men of color, and the crisis has really taken the form of public discourse that's connected to a, a set of negative stereotypes and outcomes for this particular subgroup within American society that we're all familiar with. So high rates of suicide, incarceration, and homicide within the context of schools where I primarily work, overrepresentation in suspension and expulsion rates, and then underrepresentation in advanced placement and honors courses. And so all of these negative outcomes get framed as a crisis that is a cause for concern that we need to address. And so I, I come at the question as well around how this crisis often obscures us, particularly teachers, in their role in helping students learn, and black boys and boys of color in particular, it obscures their ability to see them as learners that have great potential and promise that they need to be 
open to discovering and uh, create a disposition of curiosity seeking to understand rather than a disposition that internalizes these stereotypes and this crisis so that black boys and men of color become something that needs to be quarantined and controlled rather than something that needs to be cultivated and taught and learning being the, mm -hmm. the, the emphasis. So helping teachers see this crisis as uh, something that obscures their ability to see black boys and boys and men of color as something that is in need of support and development and coaching. Yeah. Hmm. I want to ask about the question about masculinity or manliness. You know, when I was growing up, I was born in 1961, and if you said the term masculine, he's very masculine, you would automatically know a set of, of characteristics, or that was a manly thing to do, or even there was the term unmanly. Or somebody said to me at my mother's funeral, someone sent a note, I had, uh, he was an older man, my parents' contemporary, and I had given an, a eulogy um, sort of about my very close relationship with my mother. And he, he said, and, and, I, and it was just interesting to me, he said, I would have spoken also, but your speech unmanned me, which I think he made, it made him cry a little bit. And it, he didn't feel comfortable to get up when he was in that. And so what I'm just wondering is, now that in so many ways we've uncoupled things from someone's gender, that maybe the things that in a checklist from 1968 we would have called manly and, and, and on another checklist we would have called more feminine, is now that we've kind of uncoupled a person's gender from what particular character traits the person has, is there still such a thing as masculinity or manliness? And to, well, I'll go through one more time this setup and then we'll ask the other way around, but I'll start with you again. Uh, I think that in an esoteric way, right? Like we all want to think that gender, you know, yeah. exists in this ephemera now, and we have, we're post-gender, or some of us are post-gender. Uh, and I really get the optics of being a trans man who's saying this. Uh, but I feel like I live in a paradox every day, where um, I I knew I I knew in some way that I don't know how to explain that in an innate way I needed to live in this body. And I also know that as soon as I was living in this body, um, I was experiencing what the culture saw as what being a man meant in really real, really concrete terms. And I promise that we are not post-masculinity. Yeah. Um, I, I walked through my life, as soon as I would leave my apartment every day, I'd be so happy in my body. And then I would leave my apartment every day and just the way the world was in response to me because of how I am now was so alarming. Um, what do you mean? So in a positive way, but alarming, uh, all the privileges I got overnight. Uh, the story I like to tell is, um, when I was 30, I was working at the Boston Phoenix as a, as a reporter. And um, my transition, I, I, I went on testosterone. And it, was, it happened for me very quickly, like the, the changes. So within three months, I looked kind of like this. Um, and even though I was working with the same people, and even though I was in the same job, which is very low level, uh, I was at a meeting, and we were all talking in the newsroom. And you know, newsrooms are very like raucous and you know, whatever, crazy. And this was an alt-weekly, alt uh, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of vibe. And we were all talking. and. Um, and I said something, and something kind of passionately, but just sort of in the same tenor as other people, and people got silent. And it never happened to me before. Like, I couldn't remember ever <laughs> saying something out loud in a group of mostly men mm -hmm. and having everyone listen. Um, and it was literally silence. I mean, it was unbelievable. <laughs> uh, so that's like, that's a small example. Um, but also, you know, walking down the street at night, which now I'm safe to do. But also when I walk down the street at night and there's a woman on, you know, in front of me, I feel so conscious of how much I am a fear. Um, I'm creating fear for her, you know? Uh, so, you know, a thousand things like that. Um, on a more personal level, my mom died in 2014, and uh, in 2015, um, the reason my book even came into being is because I was really angry after my mom died. And I think I was so angry because I wasn't allowed to be sad. Um, like, literally, nobody touched me. Uh, mm. <laughs> and that was a new thing. And um, there wasn't room to be a sad person who was also a man. And that had never been true for me before. Um, and uh, I was walking around angry, and I think it was probably giving off a vibe. And I kept being in situations where guys kept trying to street fight me, like actually fight me in the street. Three times it happened. And the third time, um, I almost fought the guy back. And uh, that's when I sort of felt like at a turning point in myself where I was like, I need to start asking questions about what this all means, or else I feel like I'm just going to become this person, you know? So, in, you know, is there still a meaning to masculinity? I think as a culture, absolutely. I think we all still have ideas about what being a man means, whether or not we're conscious of them. And I think some of us are trying to be more conscious of gender in a way that I think is expansive and 
progressive and, and helpful, but I don't think we've all done the interrogation necessary to actually you know, really make gender visible. And I think most men don't even know they have a gender. Mm. Um, and that's what I've learned as a man. And, and that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. I just, when you talked, I just had this one thought, you know, I've always been very, very pro gun control and I still am pro gun control. But I remember at one point thinking, if I had a gun, I'd be like a man. I could go on the subway at any time. Yeah. I could walk on any street. I'd be like a man. And mm -hmm. so it was just kind of a realization that men have a different, that a very mm -hmm. soulful way. I mean, I know if I had a gun, I would immediately shoot myself in the foot and then the, <laughs> see, see the gun to the person who would then rape me and kill me. But, <laughs> but I, so I'm not gonna get a gun. But I just really thought it must be really different to just find a bathroom in a, in a basement of a building, you know, if you're a man versus a woman. Yeah, yeah. it's unbelievable the amount of privilege that men have, I, yeah. 100%. And part of my journey has been uh, feeling safe to say that, which has been hard work just to other men out there. Like, it's hard work to talk about masculinity because you're not supposed to talk about masculinity. It's like mm -hmm. the first rule, like Fight Club, you know? <laughs> and so saying these sorts of things, like, you know, it puts you at risk in some ways, like professionally and also I think for me personally as a trans man, but I try to because it's real. And I think when women are talking about um, threats of violence and all of these things, like if men don't say, yeah, that's absolutely true, um, you know, it's gaslighting. So yeah, 100%, I can, I can confirm from, from this side of the coin. Okay. <laughs> Um, I also think that masculinity is still a thing, and um, just to give sort of a social psychological answer to that, there's, Michael wrote this essay in um, 1994 that's become really famous in the field, Masculinity as Homophobia, um, and in it he said, um, he had a standing bet with a friend, he says, I have a standing bet with a friend that I can start a fight on any middle school campus in the United States, all I have to do is um, go up and ask a group of boys, who's the sissy around here? Um, and once you do that, you, the idea is that, right, somebody's gonna get called a sissy to have their manhood called into question, they'll have to do something. Um, fast forward 30 years, and social psychologists have actually started putting this um, idea to experimental tests. Um, there's a body of scholarship called social identity threat, where identities that we really care about passionately, when they're threatened, social identity threat theory suggests that we don't respond by backing down, we actually double down and try to perform those identities in more exaggerated ways. So the way that um, this scholarship works in relation to masculinity, and I think it's an interesting way of asking what is masculinity today? Well, when you take masculinity away from someone, what do they do? How do they, how do they perform, how do they respond to that? Um, in experiments, this is done, they bring people into, mostly college students, because a lot of it's done by psychologists, and um, they bring people into labs and they give them tests, and this isn't the real experiment yet, that are tests of their gender identity, and they're given false feedback. Some of the men are told, you tested in the masculine range, and some of the men are told, you tested slightly in the feminine range, and then the real experiment comes in, and they find out what happens to the men who had their gender identities challenged. Mm -hmm. And it turns out those men are more likely to identify as Republican. Those men are more likely to say they'd like to buy an SUV. They're more likely to support uh, <laughs> statements um, of uh, male supremacy. Um, they're less likely to uh, identify sexual assault as sexual assault. Um, they're more supportive of violence and war. And so masculinity clearly is still a thing. I think sometimes we're not aware of it, but when men's masculinity is challenged, they react in patterned ways. Yeah. Um, I, wanna, is, I wanna come at this a little bit differently because I do a lot of uh, talks uh, with, uh, with young men. Um, and I wanna say that, you know, we're having this debate that I think all of us probably agree that this, this debate about toxic masculinity is poorly <clears throat> framed and not, and not very well thought through. And so I want to say, <clears throat> I want to t tell you a little story about how I see this as, uh, as a real thing. I, I, I was giving the, um, the sexual assault awareness lecture at West Point um, uh, uh, not long ago. And I walked in and I, you know, here's a room of 1,200 cadets. And I said to them, what does it mean to be a good man? And they gave me, these are cadets at West Point. They told me, what's, what's the first thing they said? Honor, duty, sacrifice, be a provider, protector, responsible, stand up for the little guy, do the right thing. Um, and, I th and they said, that's what it means to be a good man. I said, okay, fine. And by the way, just to let you all know, that's clearly what it means to be a good person. But they experienced this as deeply gendered. So where did you learn that, I said. 
And they said, it's, it's everywhere. It, it, it's Homeric. It's Shakespearean. It, it's the Judeo-Christian heritage. That's what it means to be a good man. I said, okay, fine. So that's what it means to be a good man. Now answer this question for me. Um, answer, tell me if those same values or virtues or traits would, would come into your head if I said, man the F up. Be a real man. And they said, oh, no, no, that's completely different. I said, well, what does that mean? And they said, be strong, be stoic, never show your feelings, com you know, win at all costs, suck it up, play through pain, get rich, get laid. <laughs> and I said, okay, where did you learn that? And they said, in order, my father, my coach, my guy friends, my older brother. So here's what I think we learned from that, that there's a tension in men's heads between what it means to be a good man and what it means to be a real man. And here's what I would say to the men in the audience, because I, 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 I've never met you, but I believe that this has happened to virtually every one of you. And this is something that I talked about a lot with, with my 19-year-old son. There will be a time in every one of our lives when we will be asked to betray our own values about what it means to be a good man in order to be seen as a real man by other guys. We will be asked to not see what we see, not say something about what we see, not intervene, not do the right thing. We will be asked to do the wrong thing. And what I, what I feel that I want, you know, I wish I could tell my son just how awesome I am, but I really like to tell him the times I fucked it up, the times that I did the wrong thing, and how ashamed I am still today. Those are the conversations I think we need to have. Masculinity is very much a thing to men, but I think there's a tension. So the question isn't, for us to say, that's toxic, you're doing it wrong, be more like this. But for me to say, how can we support you to living up to not my values about what it means to be a man, but yours? Because that's what I think is happening. Those, those, uh, those, that gender policing, which starts you know, so, so young, and every one of us knows it, that gender policing is what keeps us from acting in the ways that we, in fact, want to act. So I think that's a dynamic that we can, you know, and, 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 and that's a place where we can support men and, and boys in acting in the ways that they want to, that, that, they, that they know that that's what it means to be a good man. So similar to the other panelists, I do as well think that, that masculinity in America is alive and well, and thinking about it in terms of norms of black masculinity in particular, and so as I shared in my introduction, I began my career in education as a first grade teacher. It was in a single sex intervention for a group of first grade black boys. My well-meaning principal at the time, who was very well respected in the district, asked the pre-K three and pre-K four teachers, can you give me a list of students who you feel are in need of an early intervention in terms of their behavior or in terms of their potential for academic failure? And all of the pre-K three, pre-K four teachers began to put their <coughs> list of students together and by default, it became a list of boys. And so I became the embodiment of an intervention for this group of boys that she said to me on the very first day of teaching, you are their last chance. <laughs> so that was my, my introduction to classroom teaching um, <laughs> right out of college. A little on your shoulders. Yes, yes, yes. But even in graduate school or in my undergrad, being handed instructional strategies that were proven to be effective or curricula that were, you know, and proven to be effective with students as well, that it became very clear early on that those curricula or those strategies were gonna be unsuccessful if I wasn't thinking about how the boys were showing up in my classroom, thinking about themselves as individuals in the world. And it was very much deeply tied to these norms around black masculinity, so around hyperaggression with a preoccupation with sports and athleticism, anti-intellectualism, being too cool for school, also hypersexuality, being preoccupied with girls and women, that these norms were really shaping how these boys thought about themselves. And so I, I, relationships then became a window through which to see them outside of these stereotypes mm -hmm. and these norms of masculinity that opened up my creativity to see them as young boys who had joys, fears, desires that are all aligned with how, what we think good children should have and bring into the, the world. And I had to be intentional about helping them think differently about themselves as boys and learners in the world, or I was not gonna be successful as their, their classroom teacher. I asked the panel before if it would be okay if I asked a personal question during it, and I don't want to say the response was gendered, but I womaned up and decided I was going to do it anyway. So um, 
I was just really interesting. Obviously, I don't know you well, but you seem like good men. You seem like, and I always assume that someone along the way, as you were growing up, or maybe you had to override that, that somehow you got a set of messages about how to be as a man in the world that was very positive. And I was just wondering, when you were growing up or a young man, who was, was there really a person who really shaped your idea of this is how I want to be as a man? Or, or, or you know, family member or someone in the culture? And to mix up the order a little bit, I'm going to start with Michael and then swing around, because I saw you going into a deep thought. So I'm going to just. Deep, deep, uh oh, a uh, deep thought. <laughs> um, Okay, I'm, I, I'm gonna half punt on the question by, by, by invoking three. Okay. Um, so, so the first thing I would say is um, I think that, that the, my role models of my parents um, gave me something that uh, was, was really valuable. Uh, my mom um, always, uh, my mom was uh, what, what you might call the, a Betty Friedan mo mom. Uh, <laughs> she tried to you know, be a stay-at-home housewife and, and didn't work. So she went back to, to work, went back to graduate school, finished her PhD, did six years of psychoanalytic training, uh, became a psychoanalyst. And so I grew up with, a, with an idea that both my mom and my dad worked outside the home. So for me, being committed to your career was something grown-ups did not something that men did and women might have done. The second thing is my dad was uh, very, very physically affectionate, very, very much involved with it in my life. Um, very, and, and so nobody could ever tell me that nurturing and loving and tenderness and physical affection were not manly. Uh, so, so in a way, what my parents did, what I treasure about that, is they degendered the traits, not the people. My father was a man, my mother was a woman. I got that. <laughs> but I also got the idea that there was nothing inherently masculine about working. That was something grown-ups did. And when I became a grown-up, I'd do it too. And, there was, uh, and the tenderness and love and care was something that grown-ups did with children. So of course, when I grew up, I would do that as well. So they degendered those traits. I also want to say, as someone of a certain age, um, in sixth grade, I read uh, John F. Kennedy's book, which now I'm told he didn't write, um, <laughs> by, uh, Profiles in Courage. But in sixth grade, I thought he wrote it, and, and it changed my life. It changed my life because it was, a, it was a book about men who stood up and did the right thing, and, uh, and um, despite knowing that it was going to cost them. And there was something so compelling about that, mm -hmm. to read that um, when I was in sixth grade, at the very beginning, you know, in, in, dur during Freedom Summer, um, and that was really important to me, uh, to see um, that there were people who did the right thing no matter what the costs were. And I wish, frankly, that um, our entire Congress were required to read that book today. Mm -hmm. I haven't read that for years, but I remember it being a very moving book. Yeah. yeah. So I think of my grandfather growing up, and I remember before I would ever go outside to play with friends in the neighborhood, I grew up in the inner city of Milwaukee, my grandfather or grandmother or mom would always yell out to everyone in the neighborhood, whatever you do, don't break his glasses. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the, the message that. <laughs> that was communicated to my, my neighborhood around how to interact with me. And so I was perceived as this delicate person that needed to be handled in a certain kind of way. And as a result, I was relegated to the front porch. So I was able to see my big brother go out and play in the street and, and flip on mattresses in the backyard, play football in the, in the front yard with all of the friends that I couldn't necessarily participate in. And so school became my outlet to kind of find some sense of self and find some way to kind of be happy about who I am and just being bookish and nerdy. And my grandfather was just always that person who no matter what was very protective of me, always in some ways loved me unconditionally when all of his brothers and he, all of his boys he would go fishing with would come around and say, that boy needs to be out there in the street. My grandfather says, my grandson is where he needs to be, mm. right next to me mm. and in here. So I just remember him being that person that I always kind of looked up to that in that regard around unconditional love and care and regard and, and speaking out when there was um, mistreatment taking place. Tom? Um, so yeah. <laughs> um, for me growing up, uh, you know, I was, differently embodied, and uh, I had a single mom um, who I think was my primary influence around gender, similar to, to Michael. Uh, she was a physicist. She worked at General Electric. 
Um, she had been from a working class home in Pennsylvania, and her parents had refused to pay for her to go to anything but teacher's college, so she had to get her scholarship to study physics. And you know, from when I was really young, her sort of philosophy around gender had been um, that I guess her experience of gender had been that she had had to like have to in interrogate it all the time. So even though she was a woman and embodied her femininity, I think in a pretty traditional way in how she looked, her experience of being a woman in the world uh, was really to have to fight for her right to be a person. And so I grew up with that as like a, a guiding trait was that you know gender is an expression of self, but it's not. It doesn't. It doesn't define who you are. Like you define who you are, and your gender is one way in which you can do that. Um, but my relationship to men was violence. Uh, I was abused growing up. I hadn't. I didn't have male role models, like really at all. And as I got older and after I transitioned, I started looking for them. So I think my my male role role, male role models have come a lot through my own searching, um, and have been my peers or people like the people in this panel who um, who've been thinking about uh, the world differently and who've op offered. Um, other lenses and other opportunities to like see masculinity and being a man in different ways. And people who maybe aren't thinking academically, but who are just behaving in ways that challenge norms and challenge the status quo, of which there are many men. Um, so I think I've had to look for them. But uh, in my sort of second adolescence, I found a lot, of, a lot of guys who've been really inspiring to me just for the asking of questions. Thomas, a follow-up question. Um, I read your wonderful book, Man Alive, and I can't wait for um, Amateur that's coming out about a um, fighting career or opportunity at Madison Square Garden. But I was so interested, the idea that you knew in a gathering awareness that you were a man, and yet your experience of men was of such violence <coughs> and abuse. Mm -hmm. and, and what was that like to say, that's the person I really am, mm -hmm. and this is my experience of who that person mm -hmm. is? Well, I think it's given me a radical empathy for men in general, because I don't feel like, to sort of to Michael's point earlier about good men versus real men, I think a lot of men, I think, um, in my own sort of interviewing and, and speaking to a lot of guys, in the end have a story that's not totally dissimilar to my own, I think, mm -hmm. in, a, in a way, um, where you, you have negative experiences of masculinity, and yet you are a man. So how do you navigate this? And mm -hmm. so I, I don't think, in the end, it was such a strange um, perspective to have. It's just I also happen to be trans, so that like having to navigate that world from that place right. is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But what my what I ended up doing was just I think my intuition, my gut, of which I think we all have a sort of sense of intuitively what is right and what is okay and what is what feels bad. I, I sort of followed my intuition instead of following the rules. Mm -hmm. And over time, that's led me to to see that you know the men who hurt me, you know, were hurting. Mm. Um, and we live in a culture where a lot of men are hurting, and that doesn't make them not accountable. I think you can have accountability and empathy at the same time, and I think that's actually the way forward. So my feeling is, you know, yeah, I experienced a lot of violence, and what is wrong with our culture that that happened to me? You know, mm -hmm. and how can I be part of making the change happen? You know, which is why I'm here. It's really interesting, Tristan. I don't know that it was one person, but if I had to pick someone, I think I would pick my dad also. Um, my dad um, <coughs> is a psychiatrist and was always really open about feelings. And we sort of, we had to be open about feelings. My mom's great at talking about emotions as well, but I think my dad kind of led those talks with my sisters and I when we were young. Um, and I grew up in the middle in between two sisters on both sides. And I remember at a young age, um, when we got babysitters. We always had girls who came and babysat us. And I remember a conversation I had with my dad where I said, I want, I want us to get a boy to come look after us sometime. Um, I think it'd be cool. And I remember my dad saying, OK, well, we'll look for someone. I just want to make sure we find someone safe for your sisters. And I remember, I remember it still today because I didn't really understand what it means, but I get it now. Um, and my dad was always just really open and honest with us. And um, yeah, I think he, uh, you know, he was anti-violence and, um, and he was really emotionally available. My dad's the first person in our family to start crying. Um, mm. And uh, I think those sort of traits let me know that you can do these things and still be a man. I actually had this really interesting um, conversation after a class I taught. At my previous college, I taught a small SUNY in upstate New York. 
Most of the student body there um, who goes to college are from small farming towns. And I had a trans man who took a class, uh, sociology of men and masculinities class with me. And he didn't out himself as a trans man until sort of the end of the um, semester with us. And at the end of the class, he came up and gave me what I think today is, is both the greatest insult and compliment I've ever received as a teacher. Um, he grew up in a small community and he knew that he was a man, but he sort of was, I think he was like looking for what sort of a model he, he wanted. And he said, you know, I grew up thinking that guys have to be tough and they need to be emotionally stoic and they need to be all these things, but you're none of those things. And <laughs> <laughs> you seem to be a man. <laughs> and I think that my role models have been like that. They've been men who are just sort of radically open to sort of recognizing that the, you know, some of the posturing of masculinity is really foolish, and those are the men we should be looking to. I've done a lot of research and reporting about college fraternities, the historically white fraternities that are nominally integrated racially, but really not very extensively, and about the escalating problems within those from extreme violence committed on one another leading to death um, through hazing to, um, I feel I'm in a very odd position in terms of knowing about the sexual assaults within these fraternity houses because I've been brought in to look at some of the cases that never get make, made public. There is really, you know, the kind of things we hear about that are college sexual assaults are just in an, another world from the things in these extreme cases. And then when you see some of the men in these chapters who somehow got swept in in the fact pattern, maybe as witnesses, but still through their association got caught up in it, they're oftentimes not big macho guys that you would think that, and so I really started talking and trying to understand, and what you find a lot of the time is, if you are the straight white male, you know, at a college campus, progressive college campus, a lot of the, the messages you're gonna get from your peers, from your professors, from your faculty, is that you need to re-examine yourself. You re need to re-examine your privilege, you need to re-examine your gender, you need to step back you need to, that you are certainly not bringing anything particular to college through being a young male, a young straight male. That, that the, the thing you're bringing, unless you're on an athletic team where it is valued, but the thing you're bringing is kind of a drag on the college and kind of a drag on what the college is trying to do, which is to empower and have a diverse student body where everybody gets an equal seat at the table. And I, what I've realized is a lot of, because I'm like, why would these young men join these organizations that hurt them? and that end up with them being involved in hurting other people very seriously. And I've realized in a very perverted way, it's almost a safe space for them, mm -hmm. a horrible safe space, but it's the one place where they can go where we don't automatically think you're a suspect person. So I just really wanted to ask for my own purposes as much as anything, what you all think about, because you all have some association or knowledge with you in academic life, what about this it's almost a radioactive thing to say to straight white male. It's almost like you're mentioning, you know, a terrible th construct in a, in a way. Many people say that is. What what is the right way for them to think about themselves in the world, a and and do they need to be somehow suppressed or do they need to be encouraged to be good in a way? I don't know. If that's my question. Straight white male feeling th that as of privilege to go to college, who I think really does feel in crisis. And I'm going to start at the end with you. Joseph. I'll defer to Michael. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's several different, several different things. Uh, when I did my, my book Guyland, um, I did a lot of work on, on hazing and fraternities, and, and I liked your, your piece very much, and you really came down very, very hard. And, and in fact, you know, sort of at the end, as, as I remember, you said, eliminate them. It, this is really, this is, this is not, re there's no redemption here. Yeah. So here's what I, I would, I would expand the story to, in, in one way. First, I would say that yes, of course, straight white men have a story to tell. The mistake that we've always made is that we thought it was the only story to tell. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not true anymore. Mm -hmm. and, that is, and that is really difficult. Um, but the other thing that I hear a lot, and, and this is important, I think, p p politically, because we always think of patriarchy as the, as the power of men over women. But we miss the fact that patriarchy is also the power of some men over other men which explains the paradox of why so many men don't feel powerful, despite the fact that everywhere you look, men are in power. Right. Right? So, so I, and I think that's important because, you know, Jordan Peterson speaking tonight, and that's the not powerful. That's the, that's the language of, the not, of not powerful, mm -hmm. not feeling powerful. 
So here's and what, what, how is he the language of not powerful? Well, uh, because he's, he's sort of telling men that their lives are not nearly as meaningful, resonant, purposeful as they need to be. Um, but let me, let, let, let me say something about this, because I hear this not only on college campuses, but everywhere. And this is, a, this is the problem with greater gender equality. The story I hear is, once upon a time, every place you went was a locker room. Every single place, like the corporate board, the hospital operating theater, the locker room, the military, mm -hmm. everywhere you went, it was a locker room. It was all guys. Where can a guy go now? You hear the plaintive tone in my voice. Where can mm -hmm. a guy go now where he can just hang out, say stupid stuff, you know, laugh at sexist or homophobic jokes, and not get so relentlessly gender policed? The access but, Hollywood boss would right, be the answer, right? right? Well, okay. The, 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 but, and, and so that, that kind of plaintiveness, like where can a guy go? And so, of course, Tristan studies man caves, right? I mean, we're looking for, that's what we've been reduced to, <laughs> right? So we used to be the whole world, now there's no, it, and there's a kind of plaintive defensiveness. But just under that surface of plaintive defensiveness, and that's what I think the function of the fraternity on campus is now, is, is a deep-seated anger and resentment that we even have to ask this question in the first place. This was supposed to be our, uh, the, you know, our castle, so to speak, mm -hmm. and, we, and, 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 it was as, and it's as permanent as a sandcastle at the beach. Hmm. So I guess even just thinking about younger boys and how they interact with one another, thinking about elementary schools in particular, there's always this sense of the only way that they know to interact with each other is rough and tumble. Let's climb all over each other, let's roll on the floor, let's push each other, let's shove each other. But then they oftentimes didn't look like they were enjoying that experience. <laughs> <laughs> that it, it was, so I, I, I had to think of what are some questions that I can ask that help them think through other ways to interact. You know, did you enjoy the way Bobby pushed you and you flew across the carpet? You know, like, <laughs> or, or just raising questions that get them to think differently about how to interact with each other in ways that are more pleasurable, that are more enjoyable, that not is made to feel by them a role that they need to enact with their peers in order to become the, the alpha boy in the group. So was, I, and I couldn't just say stop doing that or don't do that anymore because that would only incense them to be more vigorous in how they interacted with each other. So it became what are the questions that got them to kind of stop in their tracks, reflect on their interactions, think about joy and pain, and then think through other ways or then even suggest other ways for them to interact with each other that, then, that help them feel more connected to one another rather than in competition with one another. Thomas? Are we oh. through this way? Um, no. Oh, no, sorry, we'll go back this way. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I think that, um, I think straight white men today, I mean, I think Michael's right that it sort of is the end of an era in terms of having sort of unchallenged entitlements. It doesn't mean that entitlements no longer exist. <laughs> it just means that they're not exist unchallenged. Um, and that's a confusing time, I think for men who hold these like concentrated constellations of privilege, so are straight, educationally privileged, white men. Um, there's this activity that's done sometimes in college classrooms, uh, sometimes called the privilege walk, mm -hmm. where they get a bunch of students against a wall and they say, okay, take a step forward if you, ha if you have racial privilege, take a step forward if you're a man, take a step forward if you're able-bodied, take a step forward if you're et cetera. And then at the end, everyone sort of reflects on where they are relative to the wall. Um, and I, I feel like that, that whole project is actually designed to give straight, white, educationally privileged, able-bodied Western men like something, right? They get to go, oh, wow, at the expense of like right, all these right, people right. Them, right? They're given something. And I think that it's really uncomfortable. And that's a group of men who today, I think, are looking for ways to demonstrate that they're good men. In my experience, when men ask questions about this, what they are, they want to demonstrate that they're good men, and I think lots of men feel like they want to be on the right side of history here. But I also think that um, this group of men, when they're asking, what can I do to be a good man, um, part of what they're asking for is a recipe that would give them immunity from critique. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, is really problematic, right? Almost no other group in society has that. And what they're asking for is one of the entitlements they used to have. Um, they're saying, I wanna perform good man in such a way that no one will call me out anymore. And I think what we need to get to a point where this group of men is open to criticism and can say, 
it's great that you want to try to do the right thing, and you should know that you won't always be aware of what the right thing is to do. You know, we do a lot of um, training men to sort of be bystanders and step up when, um, when something bad is happening. We don't do as much empathy training um, with men and saying, hey, it's OK to invite someone to have a sexually intimate interaction with you. What do you do if they say no? Mm. Like, how do you cope with that? How can you? How can you recover in a gendered way and feel OK about yourself and have failed as a man in some public way? We don't do as much of that work. And I think that those things are really important in helping men move sort of beyond where we are. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot about this woman, Niobe Way, I spoke to. She's a researcher at NYU, and she studies, um, you guys probably know her, yeah. Mm -hmm. She studies um, adolescent boys and male friendships um, and has been such a profound influence on me in my reporting because um, she told me something really interesting about um, her decades of research and working with adolescent boys that she found that at uh, around age 16, um, consistently over the years, is when boys tend to distance themselves from their, um, their male uh, best friends, who they speak about in such flowery, mm. beautiful language prior to that. And then there's sort of this pivot that happens. And in that period, like they become um, really interested in not being perceived as girly or gay. Um, and that's how they you know, can prove that they are becoming men. And so in that time, they lose access to empathy, sensitivity, um, uh, you know, emotional intimacy, and what Niobe Way would say, like anything that makes you human um, is what you, know, you, you reject. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think about that when I think about straight white men, specifically coming of age in this moment, and then being faced with a world that's sort of saying, you know what, you gave all that up. Uh, Michael and I were talking about this yesterday. You gave all that up, and then you know, you, you, for this privilege that now you don't have, uh, or you're not right. experiencing anymore. Mm -hmm. So you've traded your, your soul, kind of, to have this power that you, you don't even know you, agree, you know, you don't even know you did that, but you did. And now here you are, and you're not getting that power. And people, men, I think, in that position are angry. But I think what they really are lacking is the emotional resilience, because they never learned it in the first place, because that was like not what being a man was. So um, now here they are, faced with that reality. It's not safer for them to be in a fraternity where sexual assault's happening. That's not safer or better. That's not making them feel better. But it's maybe the only place that feels familiar in that sort of traumatic way of, mm -hmm. <laughs> of being younger and being in that position. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the lack, of, the lack of these sort of feminine uh, social skills, like that's the real issue. And the interventions we need are you know, at that age. But then also just you know, even in this moment, we're having this conversation. If you're a man and you're in this room, you're hearing this information. So what are you going to do with it? You know? like, I think that there is a way that hearing it and seeing it exposed, after that, there's no excuse, because now you know. And you can change at any point, including you know, as an adult. It doesn't take, um, it doesn't take having a different childhood to become a, a better man mm. now. Oh, that's lovely. We have time for one question. So please make it a really good question. Stand up, please. Here you there's right there is the microphone. Hi, uh, my name's James Markle. I'm here with uh, my business, GoSun, which is working on community development and introspection for gay men. I'm also a part of the Mankind Project, which some of you may have heard of, um, working on kind of introspection, being the best man that they can be uh, for themselves, for the community. Um, I am a part of um, kind of a passive re recruit team. We're not really meant to go out and say, you need this. Um, but um, I find that speaking to so men. This is a question, because we're running out of time. So speaking for men for myself and for this organization, it's hard to. Um, to get them to, to, to understand that introspection might be good for them. So my question is, um, why won't these men join an organization that might actually help them? And are there ways I can make these ideas more naturally appealing for those men? Ideas about introspection. Yeah, and, and doing the work that it takes to be the better man mm -hmm. in this community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll take a crack at, at part of it. Um, the, the Mankind Project, for those of you who don't know, is, a, is, is kind of a, a, an organization that's an offshoot of the mythopoetic men's movement, Robert Bly. And, and what, what that movement, what the Mankind Project basically suggests is something that I think is really valuable. What keeps men locked in this place of not being able to ask for help, not being able to ask for support, is of course this ideology uh, of the, 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 lone, the lone cowboy um, the, 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 knight, uh, the, the knight in shining armor that can take care of, basically heal himself. 
I can take care of it. Just tell me what to do. I'll do it. I'll be okay. What I think these movements and what Mankind Project has suggested is, 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 is explicitly counter-homophobic. Because it basically says to men, you, what, the, the biggest gap in your life is that you lack the capacity for intimacy with other men. Not a, necessarily a sexual intimacy, but connection. You know, you need that. You, you need the support. You need the, the, the intimacy, the connection, um, the affection. Uh, and, and, you know, once upon a time, uh, you know, make masculinity great again. In the 19th century, <laughs> men talked about this. There was a, an elaborate language of male intimacy um, that was not misperceived as potentially homosexual or even homoerotic. It simply was. And we've been cut off from that. So I, so I, I think the, the argument here is that in the name of the ideology, as Thomas just said, we've, we, we, we traded in all of that capacity for intimacy and connection with other men, and we desperately need it. Now, in this moment, to do so, to acknowledge that, is explicitly counter-homophobic. And that makes me optimistic in the sense that, because I think homophobia has been declining significantly among heterosexual men. All right, anybody else want to address that about how to reach out to young men about this, this idea of introspection or intimacy? <laughs> I mean, for me, I, I think masculinity, um, the, the kind of masculinity we're talking about is hurtful to men too. Uh, and I think that the more men, I mean, every time I talk to a man for any of my reporting or any of my research, eventually I hear a story about their boyhood or eventually I hear a story about their sort of own negotiations of masculinity and it's never a good story. So I think that men want to talk about this stuff. It's just um, they, need a, uh, they need to feel safe um, and welcome in to do it. I don't know how to like specifically do outreach <laughs> to have that conversation, but I know my personal just being honest and open and talking about myself has created for me a constant feedback loop with men. It's not, I would have expected the opposite and it's not, that's not been true. And the more open I've been about my own experience, the more men talk to me about theirs. So I, I think being able to be courageous and, and stand up and speak to what you're really seeing is, does create a reality where people respond to you, where men respond to you. This is, I think this is really crucial. We have this idea men don't want to talk about it. I think we're dying to talk about it, mm -hmm. but we need to feel safe. Mm -hmm. I think you're so right about that. Mm -hmm. We're dying to talk about this stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, and well, literally dying a bit to talk about Thank you so much to all of you. You really opened up in ways I didn't know about, and we're really grateful. Thank you so much.